you. And the Thai Spirit. Lord Christ, thank you for gathering us together on this wireless communication. We know that you are the original wireless communicator, and we're so grateful that you've made this available to us to Zoom together to hear your word that breaks us out of that um, turned in on self that we are so prone to because of the sin in the world. Thank you for this message of grace today, uh, how transformation comes from the inside out, and that you and your Holy Spirit um, through Jesus Christ are the uh, genesis of that change and the nurture of that change. We give you thanks today for, for all of the uh, wisdom that you will be giving us together as a group and community because of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The original wireless communicator, did you really say that? I did say that, really truly is. <laughs> So, introducing Ethan Richardson, our hey. therapist and resident. Should I go ahead and start? I would go. Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Ethan here from, uh, from the church, the empty church. Um, I, I would be at my home with all of you as well, but um, we have a 15-month at, at home, and so that, that definitely has its complications. Um, here, let me let me share my screen. All right. Um, so uh, if you were with us last week, uh, or even if you weren't, um, welcome back. We uh, Last week, we sort of, I sort of introduced the topic and just sort of brought up the fact that, um, you know, in the 100 plus years that psychology has been a thing, you know, since, since Freud um, opened up sort of the, the realm of the, the unconscious and started talking about uh, these, these principles of psychology, these forces that are going on within our within us. Um, we have learned so much about the human mind, but there is still so much that is not known. Um, and this five week uh, course is just a, a very, um, a very simple uh, kind of intro into what psychology offers our framework, what psychology offers the Christian understanding of of human nature, of um, and and most importantly of change. How does how does change happen? How do we heal uh, from from wounds? And especially, I'm thinking of um, you know psychic wounds, wounds of the psyche, of the spirit, of the soul. Um, and uh, I forgot to lay out sort of the direction that we're going to go in. So. Um, this is, this is what we're looking at for the next four weeks. So today, uh, the main question is, how does healing happen? How, from the, from the framework of psychology, um, what, are, what are some different voices in psychology that say, how does the human spirit heal? Um, and in, in what realms of psychology does that really line up um, with the way that we see healing happen in the Bible? Um, so today we're going to talk about change happening from the inside out. Um, talk a little bit about sort of the um, uh, the varying uh, opinions in the psychological world about how change happens. Um, and then next week uh, we came to admit that we were powerless, uh, which is about sort of the recovery model and how uh, twelve-step programs. Uh, and the recovery framework uh, guide uh, a powerful understanding of how change happens. And then uh, the week after that, Carl Rogers, who is a, a famous uh, psychiatrist, uh, talked about uh, the relationship with a patient being one of unconditional positive regard and how um, change really happens when we are in relationship with someone who um, who views us with, with that framework, um, which we would call grace. 
And then finally, um, we'll cap off by talking about um, Jesus, the gospel, and how really, if, if there's any hope for change whatsoever, uh, that change happens uh, by the grace of God. It happened, it's in God's hands, not in our hands. Um, so just a sort of uh, brief look ahead. Um, but last week, uh, we really just spent some time sort of talking about the problem, you know, the main, the main problem uh, of, of human suffering. And so often that problem is um, what, why do I keep doing this hurtful thing? Uh, why do I keep getting in the same fight with my spouse? Uh, why do I, you know, fly to Italy and expect that my problems will leave me, but I'm still the same sad me in Italy? Um, and, and other, um, like some therapists call this like the perennial problem, the problem that just keeps hounding you and keeps you sort of uh, running into the same problems over and over again. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I wanted to start, um, this came to me at like 6.30 in the morning when, when our kid woke up. And this is, a, this is a, one of his favorite books right now. It's called, Oh No, George. I'm gonna take the screen share off so I can read this to you. Um, so it's called, Oh No, George. Harry is going out. Will you be good, George? Asks Harry. Yes, says George. I'll be very good. I hope I'll be good, says George. George sees something in the kitchen. It's cake. I said I'd be good, George thinks, but I love cake. What will George do? Oh no, George. What has George seen now? It's cat. I said I'd be good, George thinks, but I love to play with cat. What will George do? Oh no, George. What has George seen now? Some lovely dirt. I said I'd be good, George thinks, but I love to dig in the dirt. What will George do? Oh no, George. Harry is back. Hello, Harry, great to see you. George, what have you done? You've ruined the place. And how on earth did you eat a whole cake? I said I'd be good, George thinks. I hoped I'd be good, but I wasn't. What will George do? I'm sorry, George says. I want to give you my favorite toy. Thank you, George, says Harry. Why don't we go out for a nice walk? Great! George loves to go out. There are so many things to see and do. Uh-oh, George has seen a cake. Will he eat it? No, George goes straight past. Well done, George. George sees some lovely dirt. Will he have a little dig? No. Well done, George. George doesn't even try to chase Cat. Even Cat is a bit surprised. Something smells very interesting. What can it be? <gasps> it's a trash can. 
There's nothing George likes more than digging in trash. What will George do? George. <laughs> I love it. It just ends there. Um, that's one of Keen's favorites right now. Um, and it is like this perfect picture uh, to me of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this sense that I want to do the right thing. I think I'll do the right thing. And I have a really hard time doing the right thing. Um, all right, I'm going to share again. And this is Paul's uh, this is Paul's cry for help as well. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Um, and this sort of goes along with this notion that, you know, we are not, uh, human beings are not like, arrows that are moving like linear, linearly through the target. Um, but instead we're boomerangs, you know, we just keep coming back to the same things over and over again. And I know um, at Christ Church, we've talked quite a bit about the fact that life is, is circular uh, rather than a straight line. And, and the progress that we may hope for doesn't come. And instead we find ourselves uh, entrenched in the same conflicts, uh, the same perennial problems. And um, the question is, where does my hope come from? Where, where can change happen? Um, what is possible? Is anything possible? Can I change? Um, and nowhere do we feel this more, uh, <laughs> more strongly than around the new year. You know, we're always making hopes for, for, a, for a new self. And um, I just had to show you this. Um, let me make sure that my audio is, yeah, good. This is, a, this is a few years old, but it's apt for 2021 as well. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Hello there, I'm John Oliver, host of Last Week Tonight. It is January the 3rd and we are still on hiatus. But I wanted to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy new year, uh, which is something you can still do for another day or two before people start to think you just came out of a week-long blackout. <laughs> also, I would like to talk to you about New Year's resolutions, uh, the exact middle ground between lying to yourself and lying to other people. <laughs> Every December, for some reason, we decide that next year, will be the one when everything turns around and we'll quit drinking or finally learn how to pronounce the name of these berries. <laughs> a, a, is it Akai? A, 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 There's no way to know for sure. The science simply isn't in yet. <laughs> but, but let's be honest, we're a few days into the new year now, and if you haven't broken your resolutions yet, statistically, you are about to. <laughs> and that can be depressing, but don't panic. All hope is not lost because the key thing with resolutions is not how to keep them, it's how to revise them once you've failed. <laughs> let me explain, let me explain. The main problem with New Year's resolutions is that we set our expectations way too high. For instance, lots of people say they want to exercise more, but that's hard. <laughs> exercise is like reading for your muscles, except you can't watch a movie of someone else exercising and basically get the gist of it. <laughs> so. So instead of beating yourself up because you haven't gone to the gym yet, simply lower your standards for what counts as exercise to anything that brings your heart rate up. That way, instead of jogging, simply try waking up late for work <laughs> or taking a pregnancy test. That way, you haven't failed to keep your New Year's resolution, you've just succeeded in a different way. Or, or let's say you, you bought a crock pot and promised yourself you'd use it to make yourself nutritious meals. Clearly, that was never going to happen. <laughs> so simply revise your promise to saying that you would use it, period. That way, if you find mice in your apartment, you will fulfill your resolution simply by filling the crock pot with water, setting it to low, and making those mice a kick-ass hot tub. <laughs> yes, those mice are gonna get so much tail. 
so much tail, I stand by that joke. <laughs> I stand by the tail joke. I do not apologize. <laughs> and finally, if scaling down your resolutions doesn't work, how about scaling them up to a completely unachievable level? For example, resolve to throw out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium on July the 4th, or win an EGOC, which means uh, winning an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and the Kentucky Derby. That's hard. <laughs> You're not gonna do any of those things, which is why you won't feel bad when they don't happen, because deep down, we all know, the key to a successful resolution is not hard work and dedication, it's managing disappointment, and that's it. <laughs> and speaking of managing disappointment, we will be back on HBO on February the 14th. Until then, please enjoy your failures. Goodbye. Okay. So, um, everybody knows this, this feeling. Um, that's why it's funny. This, um, you know, Freud called it the repetition compulsion, the thing that we keep on doing that we can't help and uh, the goals that we keep setting, but we can't reach. And so it's funny to talk about it in the sense of, well, let's just make smaller goals uh, or let's make them so impossible, so unbelievably impossible um, that we just laugh in the face of them and we enjoy the disappointment that is being human. <laughs> um, or we do this, um, like like this New Yorker cartoon. Um, look, I promise I'll change. I can't promise I'll change, but I can promise I'll pretend to change. Um, and life becomes this this massive charade um, with the people around us at work, but also in our home lives. You know, the change that we cannot bring about. Uh, we just we just bring about the facsimile of it. You know, we we look the part um, and. Uh, and the rest stays unchanged. So in thinking about um, psychology, uh, the way that psychology frames change, uh, we talked a little bit about Freud last time. Uh, psychology is not in agreement about how change happens. And um, in the interest of time and um, uh, I and just going to sort of oversimplify things here. Um, it seems like there are kind of two competing factions in psychology about how change happens. Um, one of them is that change happens from the inside out. And then the other is that the change happens from the outside in. Uh, Freud, who is like the father of psychology, uh, believed that change happened from the inside out, that change happened um, within the core of someone, uh, the core of ourselves. Um, he's the founder of what is now considered um, psychodynamic theory. And psychodynamic theory basically means that um, problems, uh, problems, uh, problematic behaviors and symptoms come from within the person. Um, not from outside the person. And so dealing with those problems also requires diving into the, into the inner self. Um, and that is very different from B.F. Skinner and the behaviorism movement. Uh, Skinner came about 50 years after and um, is the father of so many different forms of psychotherapy now, but behaviorism um, is a different framework. It says basically that uh, if you wanna change the person, you change their environment. Change happens from the outside in. So if you can change the person's behaviors, then their heart can change too. Um, this, is, this is a very simple uh, way of seeing it, but um, on the left hand, you have behaviorism um, where the behaviors are the problem. Uh, so this little this little boy has left his room a mess, and uh, he's getting the wagging finger from mom, and that is an external lesson that there are consequences to leaving your room a mess. And on the flip side, when his room is organized and his books are stacked up and his teddy bears on top of his books, uh, and he gets a gold sticker and some ice cream, uh, his external circumstances are, um, 
reinforcing the idea that if he behaves, if he does, if he does the behaviors uh, that he has just done, he will get goodies. Um, so for the behaviorists, the behaviors themselves are the problem. And those problems come from our relationship with the outside world, from the experiences that we have, uh, the culture that we uh, live in and learn from, and the way to um, the way that behaviors are built are by a continual series of rewards and punishments. Those rewards and punishments kind of condition us. Uh, when we get our wrists slapped at work for showing up late, uh, in our minds, we're learning, oh, it's not good to show up late, I need to show up on time. Um, if I'm trying to, uh, <clears throat> if I'm trying to quit smoking, it's not a good idea to have cigarettes in the passenger seat um, next to me because cigarettes are in my actual environment um, and if I see them there, I'm gonna want them. Uh, so from the, from the behaviorist standpoint, change, change happens um, if you can change the environment. If you can change the environment, you can change the person. Change comes from the outside in. So if you can remove cigarettes from your car, from your house, um, if you can stop um, leaving a messy room, your, your mother will finally love you. Um, if you can, if you can build habits in, in the world around you um, that, that sort of represent the kind of life that you want, then you can have the life that you want. Um, all of that is structured by behaviors, um, behaviors and conditions from the outside world. Now on the flip side, um, the psychodynamic framework, Freud's framework and all of his uh, descendants after that tend to say that the problem is deeper. Uh, the problem is not the behaviors. The behaviors, while they may be problematic, the behaviors are just symptoms of a, of a deeper problem, of a deeper need that um, sometimes we don't even, we don't even know about. Um, the iceberg metaphor is used a lot to describe um, the psychodynamic framework because um, you know there's the there's the part of the iceberg that we can see that's the pro that's the part of the problem that we're conscious of but then there is a massive part of the iceberg that you can't see that lies underneath the surface and with that part of the problem um, we're talking about like core emotional needs um, that have gone unmet either when we were children uh, or throughout our relation, relational lives, um, and most importantly, in our relationship with ourselves. So all of those things go unconscious. You know, we, we don't even think about those things, but those are often the things that are driving the engine of leaving a messy room or smoking cigarettes or having an issue with our spouses. Um, those problems pop up in the surface but the, but the need, uh, the deeper need is often um, unaware. We're unaware of it. Um, so um, from the psychodynamic framework, um, change, like maybe behavioral change um, can help in a, in a small way. It can change your behaviors for a short period of time. Um, but if you wanna change a person, you have to change the core of a person. Uh, you have to change their um, one one word that's used or a term that's used is their their internal working model. You know the way that the way that they are that we're coded to relate to each other. The way that we're um, the, the way that we were parented. Um, we have to have a new kind of emotional experience in order to um, see the world in a different way. And if we can see the world in a different way, then our behaviors might change. Um, so all of it is sort of these two competing, um, frameworks are basically saying, um, different things about the etiology of suffering. 
suffering, does suffering come from our behavior um, or does suffering come from something, something that's um, deeper, a wound that's deeper in, in, our, in the core of ourselves? Um, and these, these, two, these two distinctions draw some really um, interesting parallels with the way that Jesus um, talks to uh, both his disciples and talks about the Pharisees uh, and uh, the shape of his parables and the way that we talk about um, sin in, in the church. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we read this last week. This is a total inside out kind of framework um, coming from Jesus himself. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. And then on the flip side, you have, um, you have the Pharisees who were impeccably um, led, you know, impeccably moral lives. They, 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 they were on the best behavior, you know. Um, they tithed a tenth of their income. They went to church every Sunday. They went to the best schools. They made responsible decisions. Um, but Jesus didn't have the highest regard for Pharisees um, because this understanding uh, wasn't quite there. Uh, this is what Jesus said about them. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside... They are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. So here you have um, inside out versus outside in, um, but in terms of righteousness and God's favor. How do I earn God's favor? How do I, um, how do I see God's God's love as it relates to me? Does God's love come because I behave? Is it reinforced because I do the right behaviors? Um, Jesus says, no, that's the outside of the cup. The inside of the cup is what needs to be cleaned. And so um, I think about this, and then I think about a number of, of stories where Jesus interacts with uh, those who um, are not clean on the outside but receive cleansing on the inside. Um, I didn't have time. I, I wanted to read the Zacchaeus story from uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, but the, the Zacchaeus story is such a beautiful picture of that. You know, Zacchaeus uh, hears that Jesus is coming. Uh, he's, he's sort of a rotten character in his town. Uh, he's short. He's ugly. Uh, no one really wants to hang out with him. And as Jesus is coming into town, he climbs a tree so that he can see above everyone else and, and be able to see Jesus. Um, and Jesus knows who Zacchaeus is, but he invites himself over to his house. Uh, and, he, and he hangs out with all the unfavorables. And that piercing act of love uh, is what provides the change agent. You know, that is the change that actually takes place in his life. Um, and suddenly, at the dinner table during this party, um, with all the other unfortunates sitting around the table, um, Zacchaeus says, you know, I will give. I will give everything that I've taken away, um, and then some. So transformation comes to the house, uh, but it comes because Jesus uh, changes something at the core of Zacchaeus. Uh, it's not about his behaviors. The behaviors come after that initial internal change takes place. Um, and since we're, uh, since we're, we started with a children's book, um, 
I was thinking about, yeah, where, where do we see, um, children are such a good uh, place to start when we're talking about this because um, children just like, just like us often can't do the thing uh, that they want to do or the thing that they're you know, supposed to do, but they also can't hide it in the way that we can. And so um, I think this, this book is such a good picture of um, all the, all the push from the, from the outside world to change um, and to change from the outside in. And then how, how change actually happens. I won't say anything more. If you've read it before, great. Um, it's, it's good every time. But um, here, let's play it. Pout Pout Fish. Written by Deborah Deason, pictures by Dan Hanna, and read by Auntie Lee. Deep in the water where the fish hang out lives a glum, gloomy swimmer with an ever present pout. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes a clam with a wide winning grin and a pearl of advice for her pal to take in. Hey, Mr. Fish, with your crosstown frown, don't you think it's time to turn it upside down? says the fish to his friend. Nice thought, Ms. Clam. I hear what you're saying, but it's just the way I am. I'm a pout, pout fish with a pout, pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes a jellyfish, he floats through the ocean, his tentacles all trailing in a gentle locomotion. Hey, Mr. Fish, with your daily scaly scowl, I wish you wouldn't greet us with a grimace and a growl, says the fish to his friend, Mr. Jelly, I agree. I'd like to be more friendly, but it isn't up to me. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes the squid, quite a slender, squiggly sight. She is squirmy, she is squelchy, she is slightly impolite. Hey, Mr. Fish, you kaleidoscope of mope, how about a smile, a little joy, a little hope? Says the fish to his friend, Mrs. Squid, I would try, but I haven't any choice. Take a look and you'll see why. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub. Bub. Along comes an octopus with eight great arms, covered on the underside with tiny sucker charms. Hey, Mr. Fish, let me tell it to you straight. Your hulky bulky sulking is an unattractive trait, says the fish to his friend, Mr. Eight, my chum. With a mouth like mine, I am destined to be glum. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Now along comes a fish in a silent silver shimmer. The gang has never seen before this bright and brilliant swimmer. She approaches Mr. Fish, but instead of saying hey, she plants a kiss upon his pout and then she swims away. Mr. Fish is most astounded. Mr. Fish is just aghast. He is stone-faced like a statue. Then he blinks and speaks at last. My friend, says Mr. Fish, I should have known it all along. I thought that I was pouty, but it turns out I was wrong. 
I'm a kiss kiss fish with a kiss kiss face for spreading cheery cheeries all over the place. So I'll smooch, 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 smooch. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, so yeah, there's this, um, he gets a lot of good moral advice <laughs> and, um, and the pout pout fish can't help who he is. Uh, the only thing that can change him is a change of heart. And, um, I think in a lot of ways, that's also the way that we relate to God, the way that we tend to think about how we, um, we ought to be. This is from Frank Lake, who's, um, sort of a, a hero, um, he's a theologian, but also a psychiatrist and, um, uh, wrote a great book called clinical theology. And this is what, this is one of the things he says about sort of, um, what morality, uh, especially in light of, um, our relationship to God, uh, has, has done to us. Morality created an impasse for it laid the onus of maintaining the good relationship between ourselves and God on our own moral effort. It laid the onus of restoring the relationship broken by our evil on our own reparative toil. The more seriously we took this task in hand, the more self-directed activity resulted, the more we focused on ourselves. The goal that motivated our good works was our own good rather than the good of others. The very success of this moralistic way of keeping in with God and conscience tended to self-sufficiency, self-congratulation, and pride in some subtle form. At every stage of this law-centered way of working, of working out our own merited relationship with God, we were faced either with the impasse of failure or the paradoxical impasses of success. Um, and that's a really interesting idea, that success could be its own impasse. Um, surely we know the impasse of failure, you know, like the New Year's resolutions, but we don't often think about success, uh, success in our, you know, moral relationship with God being a dead end too. And if we're successful, um, that still we lose sight of the actual relationship, the romance of God. Uh, the kiss that comes from God. And I'm also reminded of this, um, both for the pout pout fish and for Zacchaeus uh, and for our own inner longings, uh, that this is the real seed of change. It's not, it's not a new behavior plan. Um, it's not learning to um, emotionally attune better. It's this gift that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The, ki the kiss came with our pout-pout face, um, not because we put on a smile. Um, and that is where I'll stop. And I'd love to hear um, what this brings up for you. Um, Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. People yeah. can also put their questions in the chat, right? Yeah, definitely. You can also ask them out loud. You don't have to put them in the chat. Just if no. you don't know what's speaking. Charlie, you up? Hi. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I think that was just excellent. I just think it was so meaningful. Yeah. Trying to put something that's a little difficult to understand in terms that you can grab a hold of. Mm. 
Anyhow, thank you very much. I think it was excellent. Thanks, Sonia. Can I ask a question, Ethan? Yeah. It's Mike Dickens. Hey, Mike. You know, hi. Uh, you know, just having been a pediatrician for all those years and thinking about all the questions I used to get about how to raise my child, isn't parenting just one great exercise in outside in? Yeah, yeah. And, and how is that bad? Yeah. I mean, you're not saying that we shouldn't try. Uh-huh. Yeah. What, to provide our children with a moral code and yeah and so forth sure sure yeah i'm in the thick of it right now and i uh, know <laughs> yeah in the um one of the things that at, at least i'm experiencing as a new parent um you know we've we still feel like we're new parents and it's been you know a year and a half um and uh yeah we are still new parents but what we're craving, what we're craving is advice. You know, what, what's a behavior plan for sleep schedules or for, um, you know, getting our kid outside more, getting him to explore more, getting him to um, eat the right kinds of foods. And um, there's all sorts of um, ways that we feel responsible to, um, to work on him, like you said, from the outside in. And what I'm learning more and more, uh, both in my work, but also um, in my like my readings um, and in my day to day experience with my kid is that, yes, it's important that, that we be good examples to him and that we sort of um, we show him, you know, the moral codes. Um, but what the kid really needs uh, is is his mom and his dad and the hands of security and safety. And um, there's so many parenting books and there's so many ways, you know, a lot of times we feel like the pout pout fish where uh, we're getting a lot of advice about try this, try that, try this. Um, but what we're building in our child um, and what God is building in our child is, um, is an internal working model, you know, an emotional um, understanding of um, like, can I trust, can I trust people? And um, am I loved? Am I loved by my parents? And from that comes, um, to me, I'm learning that's the starting point. There's tons of details to think through and there's tons of um, behaviors to try to put into place, but at the heart of it, um, the unconditional love of my mom and dad is, is where it all, where it all comes back. So, yeah, um, parenting is a really interesting, a really interesting, uh, discussion point because we tend to get really fixated on the, the outside end details, um, the notions of discipline and, um, but well, I, I didn't mean necessarily discipline. I meant everything. You're trying to shape your child yeah. through example and by showing them love and, yeah. and guidance. You know, you, t you give them a negative word when you think they're really doing something dangerous or right, right. if they've taken a toy away from another child and you want to correct that. Yeah. So there's, it's all coming from the outside, though. It's sort of like you've got a blank slate yeah. when they're born. Yeah. And, uh, right. And you're going to, you're going to write on that slate. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. The release, like the, a child's relationship with their parent. Um, yeah. The parent is outside of them. Um, but the communication that's happening is the communication of, um, of the emotions, you know, um, from, from there, um, from that relationship comes like a, um, I don't know, sort of, uh, it's almost like um, one of the things that they talk, I've, I learned in school was like, there's this, uh, in talking about the difference between behaviorism and, and psychodynamic, like you have a broken car and um, the behaviorist would say like, well, the car's broken. Like, let's, let's, let's drive it and see like what's working, what's not working. 
Um, whereas the psychodynamic framework would be like, well, the engine's broken, let's look at the engine. And um, everything, that's, everything that's wrong with the car and making the car drive a certain way is happening there. So let's focus there. Um, and yeah, when you're, when you're in a house with a small child, um, you're right, that engine is, um, it's a simple engine. Um, but the work there is, um, yeah, you can write a lot of books about it, but it's also as simple as just um, being a good enough parent for them and, and, um, and giving them your love and your kisses. <laughs> hey, Ethan. Hey, Bill. I can weigh in just a little bit, uh, Ethan and Mike, if, uh, if that's appropriate. Um, sure. Just giving your, your question a, a theological response uh, is the difference between the first and second use of the law. That's how we talk about it theologically. And the first use of the law is the moral code, which is the law, which is good. Mm. And it's what we all need to learn. And that is part of our job as parents. And um, we're happiest when we follow the law. And so all of that happens as parents to children. Uh, but then what um, the deeper issue is, is the second use of the law. The second use of the law is that that law is to convict you and show you need a savior that you failed. And so what happens when the parent um, hinges, and this is what we're talking about outside in, hinges his or her love for the child on the completion or the performance of the child, that completely um, is is backwards. And so that that's the thing that damages. And so the the parent is the one that has both the first use of the law. No, you can't touch the fireplace and no, you need to let that ch child have his own toy. Um, and yet that is, um, that's saved in a child that doesn't come across as the law if the, if the love is there. And if love isn't there, that creates extraordinary damage in a person that's long life lasting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's really clarifying. Thanks, Paul. Actually, as, as a parent, I think you find you continually ask God and the Holy Spirit to guide you through this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have prayed about so many things over the years and so many times, and you don't always get the answer that you want, mm. but God will answer it. And as you go through the years, you, you look back and you think, God didn't know what he was doing. He has a plan and we just have to trust him. And I just say, if you have a problem with any child along the way, just pray about it, mm -hmm. ask for help and you'll get it. Mm. Hey, Ethan. Thanks, Sonia. Hey, Bill. It seems to me that it might be useful to look at these two things as uh, sort of on a continuum. Uh, if you look at it as an either or argument, that either you're a behaviorist or you're a dynamic person, mm. then you run into a whopping lot of, lot of trouble. Mm. Uh, it seems to me that we use a lot of behaviorist theory on children because they can't react to their emotions in a positive, controlled way to learn from it, but they do feel the emotions. Mm -hmm. And then that balance changes that we become adults. And we realize that we have to pay attention to our emotions. And I would assume that you're from my, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're more of a Freudian than a behaviorist. <laughs> I mean, I may be wrong, but the point is that when you get a, an adult into counseling, you hope to move that adult back to these original emotions to yeah. see what happened with them. And that's uh, a different kettle of fish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Um... You're right. I, I, and I definitely wouldn't say I'm, I'm a Freudian, but, um, but I would say that, yeah, as a kid, um, your resources for dealing with the emotions that you experience, the raw emotions, um, we're, we're not able to, as children, self-regulate um, yet. And so we need our parents to help us regulate what we're feeling. Um, and so, um, as, as Mike was saying, so much of um, life as a parent is, is being that outside voice and helping to sort of organize um, 
organize a child's internal world um, for them because they don't have the capacity to do that. Um, anyway, I think someone was about to speak up and- uh, I, Yeah, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Um, so in 90 seconds then, let me say, I, so I was raised as a behaviorist. Mm -hmm. If you behave well, you will prosper. Yeah. Um, and then at 19, I, be, I heard the gospel and it was like a big reset. Okay, you get to get forgiven. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian, if you behave well, you will prosper. Mm -hmm. Same story. Mm -hmm. And spent 30 years trying to do that. For the message of grace and despaired of ever behaving well. So then I was in a crisis of, well, behavior doesn't matter because you will always fail. So got myself tied up in what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about change. Mm -hmm. And so there's a mystery for me of, okay, yes, behavior matters. It clearly does. Um, and so untangle that for me. I gave you 90 seconds of the problem. Hmm. Do I have 90 seconds to answer? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I think psychology and, um, and theology uh, don't, don't have an answer about like how change happens because they don't, they don't know. And change doesn't always happen. Um, there are so many examples of, um, you know, crucial, pivotal change experiences that happen in, in our own lives, uh, but they don't always produce the lasting results that we hope for. Um, so there are limits to what I'm saying today, especially because it's, it's psychology. Like psychology is useful in describing describing change and describing how change might happen, but psychology can't embody change. Psychology can't fulfill change. Um, and I don't want to skip too far ahead because that's kind of where we're headed at the end of this, um, this series, but like ultimately, um, you know, yes, there are plenty of evidence-based psychology frameworks and some of those are behaviorist and some of those are psychodynamic, um, but ultimately, everybody's using sliding scales of what change actually means. Um, is change just quitting smoking or is change like eradicating, you know, the, the deeper issues that, that made you smoke to begin with. And, um, and so I want to be careful to say like, you know, psychology may provide us with some language, but it isn't ultimately going to do what Jesus can do. Um, and Jesus is the only hope. Um, and the message of the gospel uh, isn't, you know, isn't, isn't necessarily going to make us not be, continue to be a pout-pout fish. We may still be a pout-pout fish, um, but we're still getting kisses. Um, so I hope that's satisfactory. I know it's not a, it's not a full answer, Charlie, but... Um, You know, Ethan, one thing I love about the gospel, too, is it I'm a behavioralist, I think, at my heart when I started having my kids. And it is about relationship and loving what you give birth to. All three of mine started out so differently. I mean, at the end of the day, I had to say, I'm not shaping them as much as I've gotten this genetic material here to love. Mm -hmm. And all three of mine I needed to parent differently and it was so humbling and challenging and eye-opening that yes I need to shape their behavior so they can go out in society but what worked for one didn't work for another and I thought it was so interesting I went to this conference at church one time and she said when you're disciplining your children to always start with the motivation for this is because I love you and I'm the kind of, I was 
sensitive like one of my children that whenever it was time to punish me, it must mean you hate me now. I am, you know, going 100 percent to the other extreme. And it was funny. Unfortunately, my children were nearly grown when I went to the conference. But my dad had Parkinson's and he had started falling asleep at the wheel. So we took his car keys and he was looking at me like I never dreamed my children would grow up and be this mean to me. He said, I can't believe you would do this. Do you know what this means to me? Mm -hmm. And to start even with him, with the premise of dad, our whole reason for taking the keys is because we love you. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to get killed. We don't, you know, you would never think you would have to have that basic conversation. But I think when we are impacting people's behaviors, that's when the wounding can come in when you think, oh, they're angry. They don't love me. They're doing this because they're mean or they're so disappointed in my behavior yeah. and off trust. And, mm. and so I think keeping relationship on the forefront kind of helps to not, you know, just be so undone. Hmm. Yeah. That's so, that's so helpful, Debbie. Um, yeah, that, that really echoes what Paul was saying earlier. I mean, like, um, and it is sort of like about, you know, keeping first things first and, um, in, in relationships, uh, the first thing is I love you as you are not as you should be. Um, and yeah, behavior, behaviorism is everywhere. Behaviorism is, you know, when I tell my kid, don't go out into the road, um, or, you know, when I, even without thinking about it, have these you know, implicit preferences towards certain things, he's watching, he's observing those things, and it's shaping his behavior. And that may be intentional or unintentional. Um, and so I don't want to draw this dividing line between, you know, yes, Freud was right, Skinner was wrong, they're, they're both right. Um, but I think one thing that um, you're pointing at is the limits of behaviorism, you know, that behaviorism by itself can't can't create lasting change because um, there's something in us that is that is wired for connection it's wired for um, for love and that that goes with our like horizontal relationships but also because of our vertical relationship um, we're wired to be in a relationship with God um, and that is a relationship of um, I love you as you are not as you should be. Um, I think what helped me, if I may pop yeah. in for a second, is it's like the 12 steps when your kids are little of when someone takes someone else's toy, asking them why. Why yeah. did you do that? And what is the result? Are were you let's identify our feelings starting from stage one. Hmm rather than waiting till we're older, but letting I just to say, you know, were you angry? Because I did not grow up with emotions. You didn't do emotions. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the generation. Mm -hmm. But it really helped to say, if you're angry, let's figure out a different way to handle this mm -hmm. and get them to name, like the 12 steps, get them to name the feeling. Mm -hmm of what's underneath and how can we change the behavior the next time we feel mm. that mm. but start so, with the, start with the emotion it started with the emotion we didn't start. have any emotion in our family growing up you know it's like you're crying that's not going to help yeah right right so don't cry you're crying because you did it wrong yeah <laughs> right and so stop crying yeah yeah so it's just a thought, but yeah, um, that's really helpful. Yeah. It's like joining everything. It's not behavioralist or the other one, but it's like together, join yeah. them. Yeah. And it's outside in, inside out. When you see the outside, try to get to the internal when you, because like you say, the external is often uh, showing you what the internal is. So to help the child with the internal yeah am i making any sense yeah you're making sense yeah um i'll mute now so somebody else can refute me <laughs> <laughs> um thanks courtney 
Uh, Pat had her hand up and, um, and, and Tom, Tom did too. Pat, do you want to go? I think you're muted. Hey, Pat, I think you're muted. Okay, I've been reading this book by Skinner. Oh, yes. look at you. And it's um, Enjoying Old Age. Uh -huh. So with old age, we might have problems raising children, but we have lots of problems <laughs> once we pass a certain age. And I am just recommending it. Yeah, There's is it good? Much to talk about, but it's 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 worth a read. Enjoying hey, old age. A okay. program of self-management, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> once you read, once you read reach 65. Hey. And this besides uh being part of AARP. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. So yes, thank you. So first question that comes up for Pat was. That book, fiction or nonfiction? No, it's not, not nonfiction, and he covers everything, and he starts out with all the problems you have once you're old. I mean, you're wearing, it's like you have gloves on all the time. You're, you can't see as well. Your teeth are falling out. You can't hear as well. You're always, you know, walking with a limp. So it, all I'm saying is you have a slew of problems. You have a slew of problems raising children and you have another slew of problems when you get old. Yeah. And the that's problems are, it's like they're never ending. So th that's all I'll say for now. Yeah. The, the, the point I wanted to make about, uh, uh, and, and Bill made it to some degree, but the notion of the continuum is, mm -hmm. is neither uh, the inside out or the outside in. Um, are in opposition to one another. There's so much overlap. Mm. And, and God made both of these aspects mm -hmm. to our character and our ways and tools that we can use. So in a perfect world, each one is a force multiplier of the other uh, so that you can, you can use both. And, and mm. they, they can both be used and they can both be misused. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a mistake to think of them in opposition to one another or different. They're, yeah. they're their Venn diagram with overlap. Huh. Huh. Yeah, that that's that's helpful, Tom. To some degree, it's like faith and works, where yeah. we talk about that, and there's there's overlap. Faith doesn't uh, destroy works, and works do not create faith. Yeah. But both of them exist. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I mean, in, in so many ways, um, behaviorism is necessary. Like, if you if your kid, if you want to learn how to, you want to you know, when you learned how to play baseball, you had to learn how to swing a bat, throw a ball. Um, and you learned because someone taught you the behaviors, the movements, the techniques. And, um, and so um, in, in terms of, you know, the, the scripture that we read earlier and thinking about sort of, all right, what was Jesus talking about when he was talking about sort of um, the inside out kind of paradigm with matters of the heart, um, with matters of um, the big questions like um, security, um, God's love, righteousness, those things follow the pattern of inside out. You know, um, God's, God's gift is not bestowed because you behaved or because you, you followed the right steps. God's gift is bestowed because he loves you. Uh, he imparted his kiss on your pout pout face, despite your inability to to act accordingly. Um, the whole this is the whole uh, distinction between religion and the gospel. You know, religion says do this, get that, um, follow these rules, get this result. But the gospel says God loves you. God loves you, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that, that kiss um, can actually change a heart. And when that heart changes, um, behaviors can change. They're not guaranteed to change. Um, and as we all know, we are still sinning. We are still sinners. Um, but the gift of that kiss goes a long way, um, especially um, when we can hear that message uh, every week, like we do at Christ Church. 
Um, so we're, we've gone over here, but does anybody, anybody have uh, any closing thoughts, Mary Lou, Paul? If not, Mary Lou, would, would you want to pray or? Yeah, you did a great job, Ethan. I thought it was excellent. I agree with what Sonia said. Just phenomenal the way that you wove all that together. So thank you so much. Excellent, excellent offering. Yeah, all of us pout pout fishes. Yeah. Here this morning, I needed to hear that. Um, and also, next week we are going to talk about powerlessness and how this is part of our kind of uh, basic principles of our counseling and um, what that looks like. So if you're feeling like, what? I have lots of power. Come back next week and find out what we're talking about. Um, and actually, I think it'd be great if you could close us with prayer, Paul. Are you up for that? Sure. All right. Let us pray. Um, Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you as your children uh, who are broken, uh, who um, have um, serious wounds and defects and hurts in our hearts. And we know, Lord, that um, change is impervious uh, in, to our own efforts. And yet, uh, we rejoice in your love and the kiss you've given us on the cross and the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And we ask that you would help us come to you in both humility and honesty as we repent, Lord, of our, um, our own sense of power and we rely entirely upon your mercy. Uh, please bless us, uh, each one, today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ethan. Thanks, everybody. Thank See you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Ethan. Hey, Courtney. Courtney. Big kiss to all of you. I want to say.